All right, welcome back to uh, Radio.com here in Boston. I'm Mike Mullaney. This is New England Lifestyles. And, you know, whenever I want to talk politics, I, there's a couple of people I go to. But when I want the fiery conversation, I go to my friend, uh, New York voting rights attorney and trial attorney, um, Richard C. Bell. Uh, Mr. Bell, it is great to talk to you again. It is great to talk. And by the way, you have a book, which has been the source of a couple of conversations. It's called Voting, the Ultimate Act of Resistance. You still want to stick by that? Because we saw a pretty crazy act of resistance the other day, didn't we? Yeah, we did. So first of all, thanks so much for having me back. I always enjoy our very lively conversations. And yes, I'm sticking by voting is the ultimate (laughs) act of resistance and more than ever, because one of the premises of my book about voter suppression is that you want to turn your anger into action and your ideas into laws. and, And that's what voting does. And I think the, the disgusting and ugly and seditious and criminal acts that we all witnessed at the Capitol are proof positive why voting counts. Because when you don't vote or you vote for the wrong people, you get the kind of demagoguery and inciting that happened that led to these events. So I stick by what I said. And and let's be honest about this. Let's really break this down into reality of what happened. Voting took place on Election Day this year in November. More people voted in the United States this year than ever before. And as a result of the election and a result of what has happened in the days after the election, the United States has, you know, it's funny. People said that Donald Trump was going to change the face of the Republican Party. Well, he ended up costing them the Oval Office Congress uh, in the Senate and the House of Representatives. It, it, it's it's one of those stunning things, All and, true. It, and it was done through voting. I mean, what we've seen is is despite what we saw, the folks at the Capitol going in there trying to change what happened, they were not able to disrupt the voting process because that is the fundamental part of what our country does. And voting overcame what we saw. It's a pretty stunning display. It is a stunning display because. You know, the felonies, which are felonies, sedition and domestic terrorism and political insurrection, they didn't win. What won was the will of the people. Yeah, it's pretty amazing stuff. And, you know, I... I when you look at the runoff election, which ended up tilting the balance of power in the Senate, I'm not sure that the passion for going back out for that second election is there without what happened in the days after and the repeated claims of a fraudulent election in Georgia. I think that really fired up the voting block. I mean, it, it's 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 really one of, again, you know, I you never thought you would see it, but what we've seen play out over these past, you know, two or three months has been an amazing lesson in civics, hasn't it been? Oh, it has, Mike, and I couldn't agree with you more. And, and one of the, the premises of my book, Voting the Ultimate Act of Resistance, is I give my history fighting voter suppression the last 20 years, both in the courtroom and at the polling places. And I don't think that anything uh, got voters to come out more than all the acts of suppression, whether it was these, these frivolous cases brought by the Trump administration uh, the months leading up to it, or acts of trying to purge voter rolls, or what happened when we saw those lines in the primaries in Wisconsin and Georgia. The voter suppression this time completely backfired on them. It really did. And, and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, And look, when it comes down to it, that's the thing. You, you've you seen, what what are the things you've seen malaise over the years of people not taking part? Unless, and you know, you see elections where only 30% of registered voters take part, you know? And that's on some lucky days. I mean, there's some state elections which have even less than that. But you really saw something where, you know, in excess of 75% of people came out. And that, while it doesn't sound great on the surface, it's a pretty stunning display. And uh, it this is it's really something special to see what we saw now one of the things that we talked about was you know 
how someone could challenge an election. And we kind of saw that. We, you know, over the course of time, I thought that it was just, you know, once the, uh, you know, the election happened, uh, the people went, cast their electors' ballots and went. But we saw this whole process play out. And in particular, the other day on January 6th, when they certified everything, that was really something that I don't think many people knew. But here I was at two o'clock in the morning after what happened, the attacks on the Capitol happened, watching the roll call go watching the challenges it was really something amazing to watch well kudos to you for watching that i thought only people like i stay up for that (laughs) so kudos to you for doing that and anyone else who did it but here's the deal let's get a little historical perspective so normally before this year that day comes every four years And it basically is a public counting of the ballots in in the Congress. The ballots of of the electors have already been certified by the states in D.C. And the vice president opens the envelope and declares the winner. And the last two times it happened, it took, I think, 23 minutes and 41 minutes, the the last two elections. It's a pro forma thing. Nobody but the legal people like me are interested in it. And that's fine because it really is very ceremonial. What happened this year? is is uh, it really is unprecedented and the and the reason is because we need so many reforms the history of all of what happened before the the riots and the sedition but the process goes back to the 12th amendment in 1804 and the electoral count act of 1887 and i won't bore your audience with all the details but those are the foundations of that process we were about to watch unfold in a civil way until the uh until the uh the the terrorists began and what i think people need to know is that we have the great threat in the next four years of this happening another time with another demagogue who's smarter and who has both the House and the Senate in their favor doing irreparable damage to the country. So what we really should be focusing on in this area are reforms that have been talked about for decades but may get people's attention this time. And again, if you're just tuning in to Radio.com, we're talking with New York City voting rights and trial attorney Richard C. Bell. Uh, his website is richardcbellesquire.com, and his book is Voting, the Ultimate Act of Resistance. And, you know, one of the things that I think was really amazingly well illustrated was how the United States, it's a complicated process, but we saw how it played out. And one of the key things is people always say, you know, why isn't it just a popular vote? Why is it, why, why do we have to worry about electors? But we saw how each individual state really mattered, how all these challenges to voting and individual uh, elections and how we came down to all these states and every state played a key part in this and we saw how you had to challenge things individually because we are states rights is such a key part of it and you've heard that over the years but we really saw an illustration of how important the sovereignties of states and state rights and state elections really are yes mike and and so we go back to the premise that we have an electoral college and the chances of a constitutional amendment to abolish it are probably nil. There's another way around that if you, uh, someone that, like me who agrees it should be the popular vote, and that's something called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which 16 states in D.C. have already enacted, but it will not go in effect until they have a number of states that would equal 270, and that would be a state legislature's getting around the Electoral College, because what it would mean is that your state agrees that whoever wins the popular vote gets all of their electoral votes, no matter which way your particular state went. But you need enough states to get to 270 for that, and then that would be challenged in the courts, and we'd see where that goes. But short of that changing, right now we do have an Electoral College, So we do need to focus on how best to have a process that is both civil and fair and is not run by by demagogues and people doing political posturing and and inciting people to break the law, because that's obviously not what any republic wants. And I think that was one of the more troubling things that we saw the other day was that, look, people protest. We see this all the time. And 
One of the things that really infuriates me is the false equivalencies we've seen over the past few days of people uh-huh. saying, well, oh, uh-huh. look, you know, well, how is this different than the Black Lives Matter rallies? There was violence there. And it's just like, stop. The, the When you try to create something like that, you're not, you, you, it's like a bait and switch. I had a conversation with someone talking about what happened and they said to me, well, what about what happened in Portland? It's irrelevant. We're talking about what happened the other day. Let's not lose what happened. What we saw was a bunch of people who believed false information. Now, look, false information has never been more able to be spread than it is today. Social media, I mean, this has come up again and again. You know, I work in media and our company is held to a certain standard. We cannot put out blatantly false information. But social media is not held to that standard. And you see false information spread nonstop. And I don't think there's ever been an easier time to buy into conspiracy theories because of it. Now, what an unprecedented act the other day where social media actually blocked access to social media of the president of the United States. Mind-blowing, right? Yes. And what you said is a great point because I will contend that one of the reasons Facebook and Twitter did what they did the other day is that because they know that the Congress and the presidency has changed and your Senator Elizabeth Warren's coming after them on just this topic of allowing the things they have allowed to do, which turn into seditious behavior. And they know it. And it was time for them to to throw out a little breadcrumb, which Senator Warren's not going to go for, obviously. But the only reason they do this is in their own self-interest, I would contend. Yeah, well, and and that doesn't surprise me. But, you know, it it really was an interesting and stunning thing to watch. Now, look, we know that some people aren't happy. And when we talk about people not being happy, look, I'm not saying that anyone has to be happy with the result of the election. You know, it was 80 million and 74 million people. So a huge chunk of people supported Donald Trump, you know, and that's their right. I would never question anyone's right to cast their vote. Of course not. Of course it's their right to vote. Do your thing, right? Right. But the amazing thing was what happened the other day was not only did... Did a sitting president encourage a huge crowd to come out to something and then... People stood up and basically said, let's go. Let's stop this process. Let's go. A sitting senator, Josh Hawley, gave them the, the power fist. Uh, we saw the former <laughs> the former governor of New York or the former mayor of New York City basically saying, let's go and find our president through trial by combat. I mean, it was absolutely it, those words. That's correct. And the idea that, look, I'm not trying to give a, a pass to the crowd. You, no one gets a pass on what happened. No, of course not. No one would ever take that stance. But to have people in power in that situation, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum, to have people who are in office encouraging behavior such as this, it has to. Have we seen this previously? I mean, you're a historical, uh, you, you know, an expert on history. Have we seen things like this happen? In the process, prior. Well, you don't have to go back that far to Joe McCarthy. It's not that long ago uh, where he, he ruined lives and, and, and threatened careers of, of, of very fine.